Peter Vest, and I welcome you to this call. I'm the director of the National AIA Resource Center. We're located at the University of California at Berkeley. The center is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services Children's Bureau. Today, we are hosting the third in our 2014 webinar series. Uh, the title is Empowering Children in Families Impacted by Substance Use, Mental Illness, and HIV AIDS. We are so pleased to have with us Dr. Carla Elia, who will discuss these issues. I'd like to introduce Dr. Elia to you. Dr. Elia is a PhD, a licensed psychologist with a clinical and consulting practice in Los Angeles. In her practice, she treats adolescents and adults affected by mood disorders, substance use, and or HIV. She also develops and provides training for various organizations and health departments focusing on evidence-based interventions for individuals and families affected by HIV. Dr. Elia has a broad clinical experience. Among other things, she has served as the clinical supervisor and training and adaptation coordinator at the UCLA Center for Community Health. And working with representatives from the CDC, prevention training centers, and the local community-based organizations from across the country, she helped design and provide training on interventions for youth with HIV. She has numerous publications and has done countless presentations and we are so fortunate to have her with us today. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that you may ask questions only, the v, only via the chat feature in the lower left portion of your screen. We will pause during the presentation and again at the very end for questions. But Please feel free to chat those questions at any point in time when they come up to you. We will answer as many questions as we possibly can in the order received, and we will email responses to any questions that we can't address during today's presentation. With that, I'll turn the virtual podium over to Carla. Carla, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. I'm really excited to be here and to talk about the, the topic today. So we're going to start out with the objectives. What is it that we're going to hope to accomplish in our presentation today? The, the first part of the presentation is going to focus on the general impact of maternal mental substance abuse, mental illness, and HIV on children's overall functioning. Once we discuss this, then we're going to focus on an, evident, um, an evidence-based intervention that we developed at UCLA. The intervention was called Talk LA, and it was for HIV-positive moms and their children. I was involved in writing the intervention and designing it and then implementing it in, in this field. So I'm going to be discussing the key elements of this intervention and how we can generalize these key elements to everyday clinical practice. And in addition to the specific skills that were derived from this particular um, EBI, I'm also going to discuss some other general clinical skills that can be helpful in our work with this population. As we talk about HIV, substance use, and mental illness. I'm sure you all know that there is a lot of comorbidity between these three variables. Oftentimes, for example, when I work with um, moms who have HIV, they also struggle with depression or anxiety or PTSD, and oftentimes there is some history of substance abuse. So as we're talking about each of them, we'll see that there's some parallels across all three, and then there's also some unique differences. So let's focus a little bit on, you know, what, for the purpose of this presentation, when I discuss overall mental well-being or lack of, 
all will be referring to maternal substance use, mental illness, and HIV. But I'm not going to keep repeating those three variables, so I'm just going to refer to all three as maternal well-being. When we look at the family environment um, of families where there is one parent who is struggling with mental well-being, we see that there is both physical and mental impairment. Um, and this is caused, again, by substance abuse, um, HIV, or mental illness. Oftentimes, we also see lack of supervision and limits and boundaries. Um, often, parents may have, you know, more difficulty following through with behavioral plans. They may feel less motivated to create structure, to provide consequences, to provide rewards, and set limits and boundaries. Uh, rules about curfews and potentially dangerous activities may not be enforced. In addition, what we also see is that if, if we have a parent who is abusing substances, there is, you know, the search for substances costs money, and there are scarce resources to pay for them. And there's also a lot of time that's spent in illegal activities to raise money to you maintain your habit. And then parents may also be spending time recovering from hangovers or withdrawal symptoms. And all of this can deplete the energy that is required to properly take care of children. Um, also, if you are depressed or if you are physically sick, you may again not have the energy to provide proper supervision. There's also lack of or limited modeling of adaptive behaviors. Um, for example, if, you know, if, if, again, if a mother is struggling with depression, she may be less likely to encourage her own child to, in, uh, to engage in positive or healthy activities. There is also um, another thing that we notice is lack of or limited affection and play, which again goes hand in hand with all the things that I just discussed, that if you're emotionally not feeling well, if you're physically not feeling well, you may not be really up for um, engaging with your children and having fun with them or providing them with affection. There is also lack of or limited recognition of child's strengths and their positive behaviors, it becomes a little bit difficult to catch your children doing well and to notice their strengths and recognize them for their strengths and praise them for their strengths. Another common thing that we notice in the family environment is that when, again, when the, when the mother or the parent is not um, doing well, the parent may be unstable. And, and when the parent is unstable, this can cause a breakdown in communication, which in turn can strain the relationship between the family members. Uh, children oftentimes may witness frequent quarrels, they may witness physical abuse or other traumatic scenarios, and all of that impacts the quality of the parent-child relationship. Another thing that we typically notice in these family environments is that the implicit family rules about um, how to express feelings and thoughts, that a lot of these rules are implicitly communicated and children learn oftentimes from their parents how to identify or not identify their feelings and emotions. Um, for example, again, a parent who may be depressed or they may be abusing substances and there may be a lot of um, trauma and chaos in the house, the child may not feel very safe in expressing their thoughts, their feelings, or their needs, and again, it's not being modeled for them. So they're not really learning how to identify their feelings and how to express them in a safe environment. As we're moving along with the slides in terms of the family environment, um, another common thing that I've also, you know, oftentimes noticed in my practice is that parents who are, again, not mentally or physically well, they may be constantly suspicious of others and may not allow their children to interact with outsiders. There's some level 
level of paranoia and negative expectations about the world. And, and all of those messages end up being transferred to the children. And children oftentimes internalize you know, these messages or the anxiety that parents have. There is also um, a, a failure to foster social interactions. And what I mean by that is it ties in with the, with the previous point that I made is that children are, I may struggle with learning how to establish relationships, how to maintain those relationships, because again, the parents are not really modeling those tools. If I'm constantly using substances, the last thing on my mind is maintaining relationships. I probably have damaged and destroyed a lot of relationships along the way. So it becomes, again, very hard for the children to learn how to establish these, um, the foundation for these relationships in their own lives. There may also be social ostracism, where people may not want to associate with a family where there is active substance abuse. Um, if you are aware of a parent's HIV status, again, I've seen many families be ostracized because of all the lack of awareness and education that's out there. Um, families may not want their children to spend time with children of a parent who is HIV positive who, or who may have a reputation for abusing substances. There is also negligence, and I'm sure you know we've, we've all seen this, where parents may find it very difficult to meet the demands of daily living, um, and caring for the child's basic needs may be erratic and inconsistent. Um, a parent with depression, for instance, could be completely disinterested in caring for the child's daily needs, child's health, or schooling, because they're really struggling, and you know, if they're if they're struggling with taking care of themselves, of course it's going to be you know nearly impossible to take care of a child's needs. As we're looking at the family environment, another thing that I that I always think about and I consider in my work um, with children and families is looking at the attachment. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Bowlby's attachment theory. Um, just a little refresher, when we talk about attachment, we're talking about the parent's ability to be able to bond and attach with the child. When we look at all the variables that I just discussed in terms of the family environment, it's easy to see how the parent-child attachment is altered as a result of um, substance abuse and mental illness and HIV. In, its, in terms of attachment, this bond occurs in the very early stages of life, and it's the parent's ability to be able to emotionally connect. And this connection can, is, is weakened when the parent is struggling emotionally or physically. The parent's full capacity is limited. In terms of attachment, um, keep in mind there's two styles of attachment. There's secure attachment and there is insecure attachment. And again, I'm, I'm probably repeating something that most of you guys know, but in secure attachment, that's where we see structure, there's stability, there's consistent parenting, you know that your needs and expectations are met, uh, life is, you know, as predictable as can be, uh, daily routines are respected, and, you know, everyone clearly recognizes boundaries for acceptable behavior. So that's the, the lovely, beautiful picture of a secure attachment. In insecure attachment, it's quite the opposite. It's where, you know, things are not stable. We don't know what to expect from parents. Um, you know, life doesn't feel very safe. And that's what we typically in, in families where a parent is struggling with substance abuse or mental illness or HIV, we oftentimes see insecure attachments. And, you know, and, and when a child is raised in a, in a family with insecure attachments, it definitely has implications in the future. And remember, when we're talking about attachment, it's not completely black and white. There's plenty of children that have strong resiliency, and despite whatever kind of attachment they were raised in, they can still, you know, rise above that. So we don't want to be black and white about it, but we want to recognize that the family attachment does impact the future.
future of children. So, so far I've talked about the parallels that exist um, between mental illness and substance abuse and HIV in terms of what the home environment looks like. Now, let's look at specifically when we're looking at families with substance abuse, some of the things that are a little bit more unique in these family environments are domestic violence, which may be, again, the result of substance abuse. There's also um, a lot of money and household resources that are spent on purchasing alcohol or other drugs. There's also frequent arrests. Um, there's court dates probation, dealing with probation officers, court-ordered therapy. There's a lot of other activities that need to occur in order to, again, deal with substance abuse. And um, so these are some of the things that are a little bit more specific to families uh, where there is a parent with substance abuse. On the same note, if we look at what are some of the specific variables that we see in, in family environments where there is HIV, one thing that we definitely see is that um, there is this fear of transmission, and that can certainly limit the parent-child interaction. For, for example, um, a lot of what I've seen, in, again, in private practice and also when I was at UCLA and running a lot of groups was that some of the parents um, feared catching infections from their children, and they also feared transmitting HIV to their children. Some of these fears may be based on misconceptions about transmission, um, and some of it may be more realistic and factual. And children may also express similar concerns about transmission, um, you know, through blood contact and also through really generally harmless daily activities. Um, they may still have some fears associated with that. I've seen a lot of kids, you know, who would just very innocently ask questions like, you know, is it okay if I share a cup with my mom or, you know, my mom used my fork, am I going to be okay? And sometimes children may not be able to verbally express these fears. They may not want to hurt the parent's feelings. But then all of that becomes internalized anxiety. Stigma can also reduce um, parents' disclosure to their children. Um, some parents may be afraid to disclose their HIV status to their children for the fear that the child may disclose their parents' HIV status to others. And, and then the child could be treated unfairly. Um, I'm sure we've all seen this, but again, even at this day and age, I'm, I'm shocked and, and just, I, I don't know why I'm shocked because I work with this population often, but I'm still shocked by the lack of awareness, lack of education, and the stigma and the discrimination that still exists even in 2004 in a big city in LA, which is at least you know where I live at, there's still so much of that, which is so sad and unfortunate. So it is, it is a realistic concern for parents to worry about um, disclosure and then how much information to share with their children. Um, if you tell your child that you have HIV, you also have to be prepared for all the other questions that come with that. How did you get it? When did this happen? If it was through risky sexual behavior, that again opens up a can of worms. If it was through substance abuse, that again opens up a whole line of questioning. It's very complex. Uh, there is also, um, in families where a parent has HIV, there may also be limited opportunities for children for social support. Um, you know, children often struggle with, can I tell, you know, a friend of mine, can I tell a teacher of mine that my mom has HIV? But if I do, can I trust them? Or are they going to tell other people? Is it my secret to tell? Or is it my mom's secret to tell? And, and then if they choose not to tell anyone, then they're jeopardizing the amount of support. You know, they, they also end up carrying the burden of secrecy. And that's a huge implication for children because it's not just the parents burden of secrecy, it also becomes the child. Um, I've had a lot of children who have a lot of anger about, um, you know, this is not fair, I didn't ask for this, I was just, you know, I just happened to be the child of this mom who has HIV and now I feel like I'm paying the price and I, now I feel like my relationships and my friendships are jeopardized because of my mom. So it, it's a huge impact um, on children. And, and lastly, um, the other thing that I often notice is how much anxiety um, children have about the well-being of their parents. Is my mom going to die? Is she 
going to get sick? How long is she going to live? Um, a lot of questions that, again, I often see that children struggle with sharing with their parents. Um, oftentimes, parents struggle with creating a safe environment for children to talk about these really important variables. So the child is kind of stuck with all these worries without anyone to be able to really process through these things with. Um, so this is something really important that we want to keep in mind as clinicians, that when we're working with these children, to create a safe um, environment for them to be able to process through some of these worries. Um, I started to kind of go into this, but now let's look at, um, you know, we've talked about what the family environment looks like typically. Now let's look at the short-term and long-term implications that these family environments have on children. Clearly, there's going to be a whole set of emotional challenges that we see. Um, there's often depression, there's anxiety, we see children being withdrawn. Um, also, if you're, let's say, a child of someone with depression, there may also be a genetic predisposition. So you have the genes and then you also have this environment where there's a lot of um, depression and anxiety that's being modeled and you internalize that. So between the genes and the environment, the child may be more prone to developing mood disorders themselves or having some sort of emotional challenges. There's also substance abuse problems that we see in children and adolescents. Um, again, oftentimes this is, again, genetic because there's a genetic predisposition for substance use. There's also modeling. You know, if you grow up with a parent who is constantly using substances, it becomes normalized to some extent. And third, uh, substance use can be a form of coping for children and adolescents, um, especially when they're not modeled by, by parents' adapt adaptive forms of coping. The child may resort to substance, substances as a way of escaping and dealing with these heavy emotions that they don't have another outlet for. We also see a lot of behavioral problems. In children. Um, there is, you know, a lot of acting out. There is a lot of um, attention-seeking behavior. Sometimes these children are bullied and teased, and they don't have the adequate coping mechanism to deal with that. Um, and a lot of this is, again, because parents, when they're not physically or emotionally well themselves, it's hard for them to be available to their children. And without parents being emotionally and physically available for the children, it's very easy to develop these types of challenges as you grow up. Other impacts on children's functioning is we also see a lot of academic problems. You see um, lower score on tests. You see a lot of um, frequent absences from, from school. There's children that are, they get to school late. And, and again, this is, it's very understandable when the family environment is not stable and consistent, you're not going to be motivated in school. Also, if the child is also struggling with anxiety or depression as a result of the parent not being well, their mood disorders will also impact their school functioning. There is, um, we also see a lot of physical problems with children. I've seen so many kids who come in and, the par and they're referred by their pediatrician. Why? Because the parent takes the kid to the pediatrician because oftentimes because of GI issues. The kid keeps complaining about stomach aches, my tummy hurts, or, you know, acid reflux, you know, issues that are, again, especially GI related um, or lack of sleep. Or, or muscle aches, things that, you know, that the, the MD does a ton of tests, and they're like, there's nothing physically wrong with this kid. So really the explanation is that this is somatization or anxiety and stress manifesting itself in physical issues. Another common impact is parentification. As children grow older, they may become increasingly aware that their parents cannot take care of them. To compensate, the child becomes the caregiver of the family, often um, extending their caregiving behavior to even their parents as well as to their younger siblings. And children that are parentified 
they carry a great deal of anxiety because they feel responsible for running their family. And the, you know, and, and, and also another thing that we see is sometimes resentment, especially as children get older and they're able to reflect on how their childhood was stolen from them, that instead of being children or instead of being adolescents, they were either taking care of themselves, their siblings, or their parents. So they really lose out on their, their childhood. All of these variables clearly will impact a child's self-esteem and their sense of self-worth. So we often see kids that, that really struggle with low self-esteem as a result of this. Another impact is that we see a lot of children blaming themselves for their parents' difficulties. And, and you know, it's not, there is no evidence that it's a child's fault, obviously, but it's an irrational distortion that a child ends up having that somehow they are responsible for their, for their parents. Um, somehow, maybe if they were better behaved, if they were nicer, if they got better grades, then maybe their mom wouldn't be using substances, and maybe their mom wouldn't be depressed. It's this false notion of control that children feel like somehow they could have controlled their parents' well-being, um, which is, again, very sad because children do not cause parents to struggle with mental illness or substance abuse or, have, or get HIV, but they do blame themselves. There is also a lot of shame and embarrassment as a result of the stigma that's associated with their parents' mental illness or HIV status or substance use. Um, I've had a lot of kids who, for example, will say, you know, I don't, I don't want to bring any friends over. My mom's always, you know, she's kind of sloppy or there's no food in the fridge. Um, and it, it's embarrassing, you know, it, it, because it becomes a reflection on the child. And as a result, children isolate. And they, they, and by isolating, they become more and more estranged from their family members, from their extended family members as well as from friends, which in turn means that the child is left with very limited or completely lack of a support network. And we know how important peer relationships are for children and adolescents, so their peer relationships are completely jeopardized, and they end up being quite isolated. And, and again, all of that ties back in with then we end up with a child who's also anxious and depressed as a result of all of these variables. It kind of goes, you know, full circle. The, when, you know, when I was talking earlier about the parent-child attachment, and I was talking about how there is two styles of attachment, there's the insecure and then there's the secure. As a result of each of those attachment styles, there, there's an impact on children later on as they get older. And what we see is that children often end up either being avoidant or anxious. So avoidant means that, and it's, it's kind of <laughs> it's, it's, um, obvious, but I'll explain it. An avoidant attachment style later on in life would mean a child who just avoids attachments. They avoid relationships because they're scared of them. They, it becomes a relational style because they feel like I don't want to attach because I'm going to get hurt, I'm going to get disappointed, so I'm going to keep you at an arm's distance. distance. And so they kind of carry that on, and then when they grow up, it becomes hard for them to find life partners, to have healthy relationships with their, you know, with their friends because they're in this complete protective, defensive mode. On the flip side, if you grow up in an insecure attachment as a child, when you grow up, you may also have an, you may also end up with an anxious attachment style. Anxious is opposite of avoidant. What this means is that I overly attach. I am so anxious. I'm so eager. I'm so excited to have relationships. You know, and when I do this in um, live presentations, if I have a co-presenter, what I do is that I just like hug my co-presenter really, really, really tight to demonstrate anxious attachment. It's kind of like the person who just wants to hug you and never let you go because
because there are, there's so much craving for an attachment. So either style, avoidant or anxious, can be pretty tough as a way of relating to other people in the world. And that's a complete um, result of, again, an insecure attachment as a child when you're growing up. So what, overall, what this means is that as you get older, you may be more mistrustful of others, and you may be less willing to attach or learn from adults. You may also have difficulty understanding the emotions of other people. So you may struggle with empathy as you get older. You may also have a hard time regulating and understanding your own emotions. And all of this can make it difficult to form and maintain relationships. And as we're continuing about this impact of insecure attachment, um, another thing that we also see, as I, as I said, this lack of empathy or remorse can make it difficult to be able to socially connect with people. We often see people that are struggling with social skills or you may feel like, you know, this person's a little bit socially off. And again, it's because they don't know how to appropriately connect with others in a healthy manner. And when we see lack of social skills, that's also related to impaired social cognition. Social cognition, what I mean by that is awareness of yourself in relation to others, as well as other people's emotions. And, and all of this can make it very stressful for adults to be able to maneuver relationships. So in summary, the, the price of growing up in an unstable or traumatic environment created by parents who are not stable themselves can be pretty high. It, you know, children pay a pretty high price for this. Therefore, it's really important in our work to focus on intervention for these children and families. Carla, this is Jean Petersack. Hi. Um, Hi. I, I just wanted to interrupt very briefly and remind people um, that if they do have a question or a comment on any of the material that you just covered, to go ahead and put that in the chat um, corner of that little box on the left-hand side and that we will be breaking um, after you um, share your material about the Talk LA. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jean. So going into Talk LA, you know, it, right now we spent the first 15 slides really creating a picture of what the family environment looks like and also what impact this has short-term and long-term on children. And that's the part that we really want to, you know, we have to remember that this has long-term implications. And this is why it's so important for us to intervene early on with children to prevent some of these long-term implications. And now I'm going to transition into talking about Talk LA. It's the intervention that I referred to in the very beginning when I was talking about the objective. What Talk LA is, um, is that it's an intervention, it was a family-centered intervention that we created years ago at UCLA, and it was for HIV-infected mothers and their children. And the reason why we wanted to develop a family-centered intervention is because we felt that it, we want to be able to intervene with parents alone, children alone, and then create a model that integrates both children and parents in treatment. And as you know, there's many approaches to treatment um, and to child therapy today. But the model that we're going to focus on today is this um, Talk LA model that integrates both ch children and parents in treatment. Talk LA was an 18 month randomized study. And what I mean by that is from the time of baseline, participants were followed for 18 months and continue, continued to be interviewed. Many of the moms that we worked with also suffered from substance abuse and mental illness. So it really ties in with the population that you know, we're focusing on today. Uh, Talk LA was, it was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. So 
so NIMH funded it, and it was an investigation of the impact of a family-centered cognitive behavioral intervention uh, with mothers. We followed moms from January of 2005 to October of 2006. We recruited 339 mothers living with HIV who were caring for a child between the ages of 6 and 20. Mothers were eligible if they were the primary caregiver of the child and they were HIV positive, and we did this based on you know, their self-report. And children who were aware of their parents' diagnosis, their HIV diagnosis, they were eligible to participate in the intervention. And we recruited these mothers um, from various medical settings um, throughout LA County. And um, we had them recruited from, you know, like I said, medical care settings, case management organizations, support groups, peer referrals, multiple um, resources throughout LA. The intervention model had a total of 16 sessions. And they were delivered in small uh, weekly groups. And the groups provided families with tools and skills necessary to live their lives the best way possible and to make healthy choices. They consisted, as I said earlier, of child alone sessions so that we had a child group that met while the moms met in a separate group. So we had two facilitators, one that would facilitate the children's group and one that would facilitate the parents' group. And then we would also have some sessions where the parents and the children, they all joined together, the two facilitators would come together, and they would, we would meet in one big group. And for all of these sessions, they were all an opportunity to learn some new, very specific CBT skills. CBT, I'm talking about cognitive behavioral techniques and to practice them in the group, internalize them, and then generalize them in their everyday life. The, as I said, the model integrated um, some CBT techniques. We did some general skill building and education, and then a lot of role plays. It also integrated family systems. So we looked at family roles, family values, expectations, um, the family of origin of the moms, what they grew up with, and the messages that they got. And we also focused on attachment theory because, again, we recognize, as we talked about earlier today, the impact of the parent-child relationship. And we knew that if we wanted to be able to intervene with these children, we needed to look at the parent-child attachment. Overall, just in case you guys are curious about the about the study, the um, I can definitely send you guys articles if you're interested in specific outcomes. And at the very end of the slides, I actually have the reference for one of the articles that has all this data, and I can definitely refer you to additional articles. But I just thought it would be fun to have a little bit of information about the overall outcomes of the intervention. What we found is that. 81% of the moms attended at least 12 of the 16 sessions, which is a pretty good rate of attendance for moms that were using substances, they weren't mentally well, and they were dealing with HIV, which meant side effects and doctor appointments and, you know, all of those stressors. For the most part, they showed up to the sessions. We found that there was less family conflict reported as mothers attended more sessions. So the, the greater number of sessions moms attended, the less family conflict was reported by moms and children at home. We also saw that there was increased parental participation associated with less sexual risk behaviors among adolescents. So again, what we mean by that is that the more the, parent, the moms participated in the groups, and the more involved they were in their children's lives, the lower the risk behaviors of their adolescents. Because we definitely talked a lot about risky sexual and risky drug use behaviors with the teens, 
and those behaviors decreased the more the parents became involved. And also, children whose parents attended more sessions reported less family conflict and more maternal bonding. We'll come back to this, but an important point to recognize here is that at least from this study, one important take-home message is how important it is for us to try to incorporate parents into children's treatment. Because you can see that the more the parents were involved, as the moms improved, so did the children. As the moms attended more sessions, that parent-child relationship, that parent-child bond improved, which obviously will have positive outcomes for the children. So now we are uh, on slide 20, which is we're open to any questions if there are any. Hi, Carla, it's Jean again. Um, hi. So we, hi. So we have a few questions, as you might imagine, about the um, model, and I'm just going to be trying to do them in some sort of order, if I can make sense over it, well, about it. So, um, so let's start with the age range for the children. Um, six years to 20 years is, is quite a large age range. Did the intervention change for these different, was it age specific? Did it, was it modified for those groups? That's a great question. So to clarify, in order to participate, the mom had to have at least one child who was between the ages of six and 20. However, for the children that participated in the intervention, we left it for 10 to 18. So the age range was 10 to 18 for the kids who participated in the actual sessions. And we found that for the most part, because, and, and I'll go into the, the skills of the intervention and after the question, so you'll see what the skills were that we were teaching. The skills were definitely generalizable to children of between the ages of 10 and 18. And the, the content, the only content that was a little bit difficult was when we were talking about risky sexual and drug use behaviors. And, you know, we had some groups where we may have had a 10 or 11-year-old that were not really prepared for that as much. But we found that for the most part, even for the younger children, they were already exposed to topics of sex and substance use. And, and they really found the, the topic um, very valuable. Great, thanks. Another question um, is, has to do with transportation. Were moms responsible for their own transportation or was there some transportation provided to, to the group? Great question. We provided them with bus tokens. So if that, was, that was our way of trying to support them in terms of transportation. Another question had to do with um, the, the, whether or not partners were included in the interventions. Great question. You know, our model did not include partners. Um, but again, remember, as we're talking about this intervention, what I would love for the audience to keep in mind is how they can take from this model and take different parts of it and adapt it to meet the needs of their population. So if you appreciate certain parts of this model, you can definitely tweak it. And, and I really think that it would be valuable to involve partners in part of this intervention as well, if you, know, if you find that to be appropriate. But our model didn't. So we have a couple more questions. Um, did you provide any incentives or rewards for the families to participate? Um, for example, did you have food at the meeting? I love these questions. People are really engaged into this, in this study. Um, we had, we always picked up food. Um, we typically had them around lunchtime, so we pick up, you know, Subway. We try to kind of do this whole healthy eating model. So we would try to model that in our groups. We wouldn't bring sodas, but we would bring water, and we would just try to get, like, healthy sandwiches or healthy salads. Um, so, yes, we definitely offered food. And how did you engage mothers that were overwhelmed 
with depression, substance use, and HIV? That's always a struggle because, you know, and I think that we all can identify with that in the sense that even in, in, in a private practice setting where I work with much higher functioning clients, there's still such lack of motivation. Um, if you're, you know, if you're struggling with mental illness, you're not going to be as motivated to show up for treatment. If you're using and you're relapsing and you're, you know, dr dealing with withdrawals, you're not motivated. And if you are HIV positive and if you're not doing well physically, again, you're not motivated. So what we did is, you know, one is that our interviewers, when they first talked to the families about the intervention, they really did a good job of selling it. And I think that's the important part. You know, how do you sell the, the treatment model that you're offering? Um, and they, they created a lot of buy-in with the families by looking at what the family's needs are and tying it in with what the sessions were going to offer. So if a mom was complaining about how, you know, her child is driving her crazy and she's just so fed up and she doesn't know what to do with him and blah, 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 we would focus on how much the interventions would help the children and that the children would also participate and this could improve the child's functioning. So I think it's really hearing the parents' concerns and being able to sell your treatment. And then once they started participating in the group, I think we just tried to make them really engaging. And they also saw that the kids really liked the groups, and they, a lot of them would come for the sake of the kids. And while the parents, I mean, again, I'll go into this a little bit so you'll understand the model after the questions, but the children and the parents, they were learning the same tools. And they found that really, you know, fun and refreshing because they would learn the same tool and then they would go home and practice the same tool. So I think that they just really enjoyed the content of the sessions and they just kept coming back because they, they liked the content. I have another question um, that relates to um, a mother's substance use um, during this intervention. Did the mothers have to be at a certain point in their treatment. Um, so if they were, um, did, in other words, did they have to be involved in drug treatment uh, before they did your intervention? We didn't require anything like that. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that if you're doing it in, a, in certain settings or certain clinics even have, you know, substance abuse, rules, you know, like don't come in high, or you have to be done with detox or inpatient. But for us, we had no rules about it. We tried to enforce the don't show up high, but even with that, I mean, unless someone was completely inappropriate in group, which I don't think we ever really had that experience, we would just let people, you know, we would just let them come. We were just happy that they were there and that they brought their child. Okay, and then uh, very briefly, um, you mentioned that this was 16 sessions, but you mentioned that the intervention was 18 months long. Um, mm -hmm. So were you basically offering these groups monthly? Oh, no, 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 no. Let me, I'm glad that they asked that. We offered the groups once a week. So they participated in the intervention for 16 weeks. It's an 18-month longitudinal study. What that means is that they're followed and interviewed for a duration of 18 months in order for us to see whether they were able to maintain the positive outcomes over an 18-month period. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't know if this, if this, if this yeah. is not clear, I'll ask it answer another one. But pretty much what happens is that we interview the families at baseline. That means that they come in, we interview the moms and the children to figure out how they're doing. After that interview, they start the intervention and they go through 16 sessions. Once they were done with those 16 sessions, then we follow them for another um, 14 months where we did constant interviews at different intervals to see how they were doing over time. Perfect. That's very clear, Carla. And then um, one last question. Very briefly, were any of the families, um, did they have active CPS involvement in, in which the child was not living in the home? Yes. Yes. Not, not too many. 
Um, but there were definitely some, and there were some that during the process, you know, that may have happened. We definitely had to do some child abuse reporting. So, you know, we had a mixed batch of that. And so I would assume that the child was still participating, even though they might have been in foster care. We would have to, you know, figure out transportation with the foster parent and, you know, accommodate that. Great. I think we'll carry on now. Thank you. That was a lot of Thanks. questions you just answered. I really appreciate the interest in this intervention. I love this intervention. I feel like, it, I mean, I call it my baby because I, we worked on it for so long. And again, if you guys are, are more curious or have more questions about it, you can definitely um, read the outcome publications. We have, a, we have a lot of articles that have been published in journals. Um, and if you have a hard time finding any of them, feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to share those with you. So now let's go into a little bit more specifics about what this intervention taught. And, and as we're talking about it, I would encourage you guys to think about how you can take these tools and apply them to the settings that you guys work with, work in. Because I can tell you that I've taken the tools of Talk LA and I use it all the time in my private practice for the past 10 years with all sorts of clients. It doesn't even have to be moms and children. I do it with, with all sorts of populations. So let's, you know, I mentioned that, um, that Talk LA was based on CBT. And you may be curious as to why did we choose CBT, because remember, um, there's so many different orientations. There is psychodynamic, there is Freudian, there is Jungian, there is self-psychology, ego-psychology. There's so many different theoretical orientations, and they're all valuable in different ways. But the reason why we picked CBT is because CBT is an evidence-based model for treatment of mood disorder and substance abuse. So there's tons and tons of research that's done that shows that CBT is very effective when it comes to depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, um, and substance abuse. So we really wanted something strong like that in our intervention. Also, CBT addresses the underlying skill deficit. And it's not just about you know depression or substance abuse or HIV specifically. CBT really addresses the, the skills that not only apply to those specific areas, but more about just overall well-being. Um, so even if you're someone who, is, who doesn't even have a mood disorder, CBT skills apply to your everyday life. And also, moms and children, they really needed coping skills. Moms needed to learn how to cope with the various challenges and barriers and adversities in their life, and children needed tools to figure out how to cope with their mom's illness. And when I say illness, I'm referring to all three, HIV, substance use, or mental illness. Excuse me. And children also needed specific tools to promote resiliency. So those are the reasons why um, we wanted to pick CBT because we wanted to focus on specific skills where parents could establish healthier habits, model those habits for their children, and then children would also learn those healthier habits and they could also internalize what the parents were modeling for them. Now, let's, let's now dive into what are these specific CBT skills. And for those of you who are familiar with CBT, you're going to see that a lot of this ties in with just general CBT skills that, for example, you know, Beck, who's the guru of cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, Beck talks about these skills all the time in his books. The first thing that we taught was using a feeling thermometer and this concept of what we call the feel, think, do framework. Let me explain what that means. When, when we encounter any situation, we typically have a feeling about it. And for the sake of talk, when we talk about feeling, we were referring to a feeling thermometer rating, which I'll discuss in a minute. And we were also talking about physical body reactions. 
then we have a thought about it, and then we have a behavior, a reaction, an impulse of some sort in reaction to that feeling or thought. An example of this is, um, I'll use something that in LA we encounter quite often, which is traffic. So, you know, I'm on my way out of the house and I'm headed to work and I'm already running a little bit late. I get on the lovely, you know, 405 freeway and it's completely packed. So the situation is packed freeway. So what happens? What happens is that Carlos feeling thermometer completely rises up. It goes up and I get this knot in my tummy, this knot in my stomach. That's an indication that, uh-oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. So that's my feeling. Then I have a thought or a series of thoughts. So my thoughts could be, oh, shoot, I think I'm going to run late. What if my client's already there? She's waiting at the door. Oh, my God, that's going to be so embarrassing that she's going to be waiting at the door and I'm going to get there late. And then what do I do about it? I call my client and I let her know that I'm running late. So we all fall into this, this FTD framework in reaction to our life events, except that this is something that happens very quickly and very automatically, and typically we're not aware of it. Like what I just described about the traffic, I'm sure most of you can relate to in different you know, examples in your life, but we typically don't really break things down and look at it that way. And this is something that we wanted to teach our clients. We literally had a handout that had feeling, thinking, doing, and it had three columns, and we would have them list out the situation that was difficult and then fill out that, that, that framework. And the reason why we wanted to do this is because we wanted to increase their awareness of this connection between our feelings, thoughts, and our actions. And we wanted them to be able to look at their life events within this conceptual framework. And we want them to do this because then they can gain control over their feelings and thoughts and their actions. So I'm very visual. So if you look at this next slide, you can see how this feel, think, do framework, it's that whole relationship. It's this relationship between feeling, thinking, and doing. And, and it's not linear. You know, feelings can impact thoughts. Thoughts can impact actions. Feelings can impact actions. It's just this circular dance that we do. So as I said, feel is the first one. And I mentioned that it relates to the feeling thermometer and it relates to our body reaction. How do we use this feeling thermometer? Now, let me show you visually what the feeling thermometer looks like. That's how the feeling thermometer looks like. And we actually had this on, um, we had them laminated on these laminated cards that we would give the client. And we had pocket-sized ones that they could literally put in their wallet, which they thought was really fun. And we had um, bigger ones, like larger size ones that we would also give them. And it was really, it was really cute because when we would have the joint sessions, the moms and the kids, they would talk about how, you know, the kid would be feeling really, you know, uncomfortable, and they would like grab mom's hand and take her to the kitchen where the laminated feeling thermometer was on the fridge, and they would say, "Mom, right now I'm at an 80, so I need a timeout. I can't talk to you right now." So it was really fun to see how they would apply this tool in their everyday life. And again, because the moms and the children were both learning this tool, it was a lot easier for them to use it together at home. So the feeling thermometer, as you can see, zero means totally, totally comfortable. Hundred means extremely uncomfortable. I am boiling. I was probably like at an 80 on the freeway um, <laughs> in the example that I was talking to you about. Um, the use of the feeling thermometer. One is that it establishes this hierarchy between what is comfortable and what is uncomfortable so that I have a sense of what are the different things in my life, 
that make me comfortable? What are the other things that make me uncomfortable? And it also allows you, by linking it to your body reaction, you can see when things are, um, you, can, you, can, you can see how you're escalating. So for example, it, for me, the first indication that my ceiling thermometer is going up is that I get that knot in my stomach. But then as, I start, as my thermometer starts going up a little bit more, I start feeling really hot, really, really warm. And if I hit 100, then I'm like sweating. So all of those body sensations are a cue that my thermometer is going up. Another use of the feeling thermometer is that we often ask clients to think about where do they need to be on the thermometer for them to be at their best? Do you need to be at a zero? Do you need to be at a 20? Where do you need to be? Like, I typically need to be, like, a little bit more like around a 15 or a 20 in order to feel like I'm at my best. If I'm at a zero, I feel like I'm not awake yet. So I need a little bit of kind of discomfort to motivate me and push me to be at my best. Another use of it is that you can also use it as a counseling tool. And what I mean by that is oftentimes when I'm in session with clients, um, I, you know, as we're talking about a topic, I will just say, you know, where are you on the feeling thermometer right now as we're talking about this? And they may tell me, oh, I'm at a 60. And then I'll say, oh, you're at a 60. What's going on through your mind? Tell me about what, what you're thinking. And then they'll, they'll say, oh, I'm thinking, you know, they'll give me the thought. So you can really use it as a, as a counseling tool. And, and, I mean, I've had clients that even walk in, and as soon as they walk in, they'll say, oh, my God, Dr. Alia, I am so at an 80 right now. I can't wait, you know, to sit down and tell you about what's going on. And it, it creates this common language between the two of us. When they tell me 80, I get where they're talking about. Another cool thing about the feeling thermometer is that, if you notice, we use the feeling thermometer instead of labeling emotions. But I remember when I started at UCLA, probably about like 15 years ago, I was in grad school working on my PhD, and in grad school, all I was learning was label the emotions, you know, teach your clients to label emotions. I thought, you know, I, I was so brilliant for wanting to label emotions. And I come to UCLA, and, and Dr. Rothram, who is, you know, the, she's the director of our center, and she's a huge HIV guru, she was like, forget about these labeling of emotions. You know, we need this feeling thermometer. And it was so odd for me. It was very counterintuitive. But I learned, you know, from her and through my experience there that the feeling thermometer is actually really valuable because oftentimes people mislabel emotions. And we especially see this with adolescents. A lot of times they come in and they say, um, I'm so angry, I'm so pissed. But really what they're feeling may be sadness, may be guilt, may be hurt. But it's easier for them to just label it as anger. So the feeling thermometer kind of counters that by just giving you this common language and not being worried about the actual labeling of the emotion. That's the Yes, Carla. Hi, it's yes. Jean. I'm sorry, I thought you were done with that that particular uh -huh. slide. I'm uh, just giving you a, a check in. It's um, we're halfway through the slides and we are a little past the half an hour mark to go. Yes, I'm gonna go faster. Thank you for that. Sure. I don't mean <laughs> for your feeling thermometer yeah, to go for anything with that. I, okay, my and now my my thermometer is at a 60, but um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do some deep breathing to bring it down. Um, so I'm going to go through it a little bit faster, and if you guys have questions, we have about 10, 15 minutes at the end, so please, um, you know, let me know about the questions. Now, moving on to the thought part, as I said, thoughts are pretty much what we say to ourselves, and it, you know, it can be impacted by our um, value systems, our past experiences, and that's what we're referring to when we talk about thoughts. Thoughts are often very automatic. Clients oftentimes have a hard time identifying their thoughts because we typically focus on our emotions and not our thoughts. So it's a really cool thing to train clients to do. And thoughts can often 
be quite distorted. That's another interesting thing with thoughts. What we were trying to teach clients was um, smart thinking, to be smart about the kind of thoughts that you let your mind and to control or counter those negative, those self-defeating thoughts that come up. And we use very basic cognitive tools. Um, you, most of you are probably familiar with them. We did positive self-talk, which is, again, you know, when you have a negative thought, instead you counter it with something positive. So if you're thinking about your future and you may think, I'm never going to make it, I'll always be struggling, um, instead you may say, I'm going to succeed. My hard work will pay off. Reframing refers to finding something positive um, in what is in a, in a problem or a situation that is happening. So, for example, if I'm stuck in traffic and, and I'm mad at myself that I didn't leave earlier, I can say, you know what, maybe I would have, you know, maybe something bad would have happened if I had left earlier and maybe, you know, the universe is sparing me from something bad. So, you, you know, you frame the situation in a way to lower your thermometer. Doing, as I said, re re refers to how you react to the situation. In talk, we had three, ex three examples of things that people could do. We had um, smart problem solving, which I'll get to in a second, and I'll tell you what that is. We also focused a lot on assertiveness. And we focused on relaxation as a way of bringing down your feeling thermometer and helping you have more positive versus negative and distorted thoughts. So everything that I talked about right now was under the umbrella of that feel, think, do model. Now we're going to focus on a, on a different tool that we had, which was the short-term and long-term goal setting. As you know, goal setting is very important to making behavioral change. Um, when we accomplish goals, we feel good about our future, we feel motivated, we feel proud. Uh, it gives us something to look forward to. It gives us a direction. And it's very important to have very specific guidelines for goal setting because without them, people often don't accomplish their goals. And then instead, they feel unmotivated and unsuccessful and defeated. The specific tools that we taught clients about goal setting were to make the goal be very concrete and specific. So I'm going to the gym three times this week for 30 minutes. That's specific. And it's clearly stated. And you want it to be realistic, meaning that you want it to be somewhere between 40 or 60 on the feeling thermometer. If it's too high, it means that you're you're overly estimating um, how much you can do. If it's too low, it means that you're not challenging yourself enough. And you want it to have a clear end point. So if the client says, oh, I just want to have better self-esteem, first of all, how are we defining self-esteem? That's not clear and specific. And second, how are we ever going to know that you have completely accomplished that? So we want it to have a clear end point. And you want it to be in a positive term, meaning what is it that I want more of um, instead of what I want less of. The, we set the goals at the conclusion of every session. We related it to the topic that we talked about in that session. And then the following week when we saw the, the child or the, or the mom, we checked in with the goal. And that was very important. And I think that's really important for clinicians for us to remember what goal it was and to remember to check in and create that sense of accountability. And if the client does not achieve the goal, then we problem solve and talk about why they didn't. We also set goals for the future. So in addition to weekly goals, we had them come up with a life project goal, which was something bigger. And for example, I want to be a nurse. I want to finish my GED. I want to learn to play the piano something that was more long-term in order to give them a sense of purpose and direction. This was an example of a goal sheet, a worksheet that we gave them that you guys can look at later on. I'm not going to go over it right now, but it gives you some ideas of different life goals that clients can have. Next, we also taught them smart problem-solving tools. 
tool, which it's a very specific um, strategic way of solving problems where the client first states the problem, what it is that they're struggling with, then they make a very specific goal. And the goal, again, matches the goal setting criteria that we talked about earlier. Then you brainstorm all the different things that you can do to achieve that goal. And then you choose the best option from that list, and you go out there and you implement it. And what is really important about this is that typically people are very impulsive, and they go to the same thing that they've always done. If I'm mad, I'm going to go and get high. Instead, you want to say, I'm mad. What is my goal? To stay sober. What are the different things that I can do to stay sober? I can go for a walk. I can call my sponsor. I can take a bath. I can journal. And then look at the pros and cons of each of those options and pick the best one. Um, so as I said, small problem solving slows down that impulsive um, act, uh, the impulsive um, action, and it forces you to think and slow down before you make a decision. And it's really important in, in clinical practice because the last thing we want to be doing is lecturing a client and telling them what to do. And these steps, these smart problem solving steps, allow the client to learn how to problem solve for themselves. We also focus a lot on building social support. Um, and the focus was mainly to increase positive support and decrease negative support. So if every time you call your sister, she makes you feel like crap about yourself and about your parenting, you probably don't want to be calling her up. You want to be talking to people and surrounding yourself with people that help you stay on track. We also focused a lot on assertiveness skills. We taught them those very three specific um, verbal cues using the I statement, saying what you want respect, respectfully, and paying attention to your body language. We found that a lot of a lot of times clients they think that they're assertive, but really they're either passive or aggressive. So both moms and their children really benefited from this and really found this very refreshing because a lot of the children were used to moms that were either aggressive or passive. So it was very refreshing for them to learn um, this tool. And um, I'm going to skip to slide 39, which the benefit of this model, which is where the parents and the children are both learning the same tools, is that there's constant repetition. There's constant opportunity to practice. There's opportunity for parents to model these tools for children. And there's a lot of reinforcement. And we also felt that the morale and the motivation and the commitment completely increased by children seeing their parents be in treatment because they felt like, wow, my mom really cares and she really cares about our relationship and she's really showing up and she's doing this for us. And the parents felt motivated because they felt like, I'm doing this for my kid and my kid is also learning all these, these things and my kid is improving. So it really benefited both, uh, both of them. And the, the benefit of the the setting the weekly goals was, again, the moms focus on themselves for, uh, for, for, instead of always caring for other people, which was very refreshing. And kids also focus on themselves instead of going into that parentified role. Um, the life goals were also very important in the sense that it helped moms worry less and be more hopeful for their children watching that set these goals for the future. And for children, when they saw their parents set these long-term goals, when a kid heard her mom say, oh, I'm going to go back to school and finish my GED, the kid also felt like, my mom is going to stay on track. She's not going to use substances. She's going to fight her depression. She's going to stay healthy with her HIV because she's trying to get her GED. So it really helped with children's anxiety and depression. And social support, again, by moms increasing their social support, 
it allowed them to rely less on their children. And again, when their children saw that their parents are reaching out to their network, the kids, again, didn't have to be parentified, and they also felt less worried about their children. And it also really helped in terms of alienation by teaching both moms and children that you do need support system in your life in order to be healthy. And um, I'm going to skip to 44 because it's sort of this I already touched on. Some of the session topics that, again, I think you guys can utilize in your treatment as well is that with both children and moms, individually and in the joint group, we focus a lot on identifying healthy physical habits and how to overcome barriers to being physically healthy. Both children and both moms, they set specific goals about physical health, and they worked on achieving it. And again, the benefit of that was that children didn't have to worry so much about their parents' health when they saw them having healthy goals. And again, the parentification of children was decreased. If mom had a goal about cooking, the child didn't have to worry about taking care of that anymore. We also spent some time talking to moms and kids together and alone about mom's HIV, mom's substance abuse, and or mom's mental illness. This was extremely helpful for the kids because for many of them, this was the first time that they could talk about mom's illness in a very safe, non-judgmental environment. Kids made a list of questions to ask their mom regarding her illness. And then when we had the joint session, they shared those questions with the mom. And then the mom had also learned in their individual group sessions how to effectively respond to their children's questions so that kids could feel safe in having that open, honest dialogue with their parents. They also talked a lot about disclosure and together made decisions about who do we disclose, who do we not, is it my secret, is it your secret, it really allowed for open communication about these very loaded, um, challenging topics. The parents in their own individual sessions, we also offer them um, one or two parenting sessions where they focus on positive reinforcement, behavioral chart, monitoring, how to set consequences, we really wanted to help parents improve their parenting and to seek support um, so that they didn't feel so alone and overwhelmed about their parenting. And um, I already talked about the joint sessions where we focused on living a physically healthy life. We also tried to establish a positive home environment. We focused a lot on resiliency and focusing on the family strengths. We focused on the, the parenting technique of catching someone doing something good um, instead of focusing on how much a child was not you know, doing the right things. We really helped mom focus on, ch on children's strengths. And um, I talked about communication and conflict resolution. That was another one where we had a family joint session um, talking about how to create a win-win situation where the child could assert his or her needs, the parent could assert his or her needs, and then they could come up with a compromise that would meet both of their, their needs. And throughout all the individual and the joint sessions, we also did a handful of role plays when it came to communication so that kids and moms could practice how to talk about some of these things. So in summary, uh, based on this model, it is really imperative to empower moms to serve as positive role models for their children. I think it's very important for moms to understand the crucial role that they serve and how much modeling is important for their child's functioning. The other thing to keep in mind is that changes made on an individual level can not only improve the mother's functioning, but when a mother makes improvement in her when a mother makes improvement in her own life, she models those behaviors for her child and then her child can internalize those 
same positive behaviors. Parenting skills are also very import, important to incorporate because they enhance the parent-child relationship. And lastly, the joint parent-child session, um, sessions are very important in improving the parent-child relationship. I feel like I completely rushed through the last <laughs> like probably 15 slides, but we can open it up to questions so that if I rush too much, hopefully I can answer any other questions that you guys may have. So this is Jean, and I would like to remind people again of that little box in your left-hand corner for the chat. And we have a couple of questions for you, Carla. Okay. Um, one of the questions was about whether or not there was any collaboration with other service providers or medical providers that the women were connected with um, in terms of the implementing your Talk LA model. Great question. We, um, you know, not too much because it was part of a research protocol, and when it's a part of a research protocol, we need to stay consistent. We can't speak to one case manager and not talk to the case managers of the other 300 people. So because of that consistency, we, we really didn't collaborate too much with other case managers. The only time that that would come up is if there was ever any child abuse or if there was any suicidal ideation, then we would talk to other providers in order to create that safety. But other than that, we didn't collaborate. Okay. And then another question, um, since you had the child, unique child sessions where the parents were not um, in the room, and you were discussing some sensitive issues such as disclosure, um, uh -huh. did you... Did you find that any of the parents were concerned or wanted to have some input into the content of the child session? No, what we did is that we made sure that in order for the children to participate in the study, they had to be aware of their parents' diagnosis, obviously, because they knew that this was an HIV-based intervention. So they were already aware of the parents' diagnosis, and the parents knew overall what the content would be, that overall children would have an opportunity to talk about any concerns that they had about their mother's well-being and how the kids were doing about disclosure. But it was during the joint session that they established what the rules about disclosure would be. So, for example, if the child in their individual session, the child may say, oh, you know, I want to talk to my mom about telling my best friend, but I don't want my mom to get mad at me, but I would really like my best friend to, to know, we would, you know, put that on the shelf until we met as a family, and then in that joint session, the child would bring that concern up, and then the parent would, and the child would talk about how to, you know, do we make that happen or do we not, and then they, they would discuss it together. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this is the last opportunity for anybody who has any questions for Carla. And here's another one. Where was the intervention provided? Great. We had them at multiple locations. They were typically at clinics, so community mental health clinics, often places that we were recruiting um, participants from. So we would usually use one of their group rooms. Wonderful. Okay. Um, there's one other question. Uh, were all of the other participants, were all of the participants voluntary, or were some mandated to participate in the program? No, it was completely voluntary because, again, it's a it's a research study, so we it has to be voluntary. No one can be coerced in any way. All right. Okay, well, we're winding down, and there's uh, one last question. Um, what were the most beneficial long-term results of conducting, conducting the Talk LA intervention? It was the outcomes that I mentioned. Um, I, I don't want to go back and confuse people, but it's in the outcome section of the slide. So it was the ones that I already mentioned. Do you guys... Jean, should I go back on that slide? Because I, I don't know it off the top of my head. No, I don't think so. I, I think it would just be a matter of, um, I guess, your personal opinion 
in terms of what you saw, what you experienced, what you felt? You know, I think, I mean, in, in, in that way, I'm, I'm actually glad that they're asking because sometimes I feel like um, what we see in research outcomes may not actually capture what you see in person when you're a facilitator. And I was also, I was a facilitator and I was also a supervisor, so I would hear all this feedback from the, my clinicians that were implementing this. And we actually felt like there was a lot more change than we even saw in the results. A lot of what we, what we saw was an improvement in the parent-child bond, where there was a lot more closeness, there was a lot more empathy for from the kids towards the parents and from the parents towards the kids, and, there, and, the, and the communication is significantly improved. Um, you know, most of the communication initially was very hostile, it was very aggressive. Um, kids didn't feel like parents heard them, parents felt like the kids were disrespectful, and that part really improved, where both the parent and the child felt like we can talk to each other more, we can really hear each other, I feel like my mom gets me. So the, the communication improved, and I felt like the, just the overall bond, that feeling of, um, you know, for the child to feel like my mom loves me, my mom is there for me, I'm a priority, that's something that I definitely sense a lot. Great. Okay, the, the questions are coming in fast and furious. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there's one more question. Um, we're going to have to be brief. Um, one more question. Any? Did you notice any different outcomes with a different combination or frequency of the type of sessions? I'll repeat that. Uh, did, did you see any different outcomes with different combinations or frequencies of the type of sessions? Well, we didn't do, because again, remember, it's a research project, so we weren't doing different combinations. Everyone got the exact same thing, which was a total of 16 sessions, four of which were joint sessions. So everyone got the exact same thing. Another one it has to do with, um, has the program been implemented on a permanent basis? No, I wish it had. Um, it was part of the research protocol, and it ended several years ago, and it hasn't been disseminated. Um, but, you know, what we're doing is, you know, through opportunities like this, we're trying to share the data and we're trying to share the model so that hopefully other service providers can utilize it. Were any of the children who participated HIV positive? Uh, yes, there were some. Did that change the intervention at all? Um, not really. I mean, we, we had, I believe, um, in some of the, the children's sessions, we had parts that applied a little bit more specifically to children with HIV, because remember, it's a group setting, so you had to make it apply to both HIV positive and negative children. But again, a lot of it, you know, when we're talking about healthy physical habits, whether you're positive or negative, that applies to you. Um, but yes, we did do a little bit of tweaking to make it a little bit more specific to the HIV positive children. In the follow-up after the 16 sessions, did the parents and or children need some re reminders of what they had learned? Yes, we, as a part of our termination session, our last session, we definitely, you know, would do a recapping of this is where we started, and this is where we are, and we would talk about maintenance. You know, how do you maintain all the gains that you have made? Has there been any discussion of doing the intervention with partners or fathers? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Okay. I think that pretty much concludes the question por portion of this. And I think it's time to close our webinar. So although um, there's obviously been a lot of engagement by our listeners, and one even um, congratulated you on a fabulous presentation. So I will chime in and say thank you so much, Carla, for speaking with well, us today. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I, I really appreciate it. This is, I love this topic, and, it, and I really feel it's a gift that I was able to be able to speak to all of you. So thank you. So you will see a couple of slides of acknowledgments, um, and you will also see some contact information 
uh, for Carla. And, and like I mentioned, if anyone has any additional questions, they, you know, they can feel free to email me, and I'm more than happy to communicate with them. And you'll see that email right there on that slide. So thank you again, Carla, um, and thanks to all of you. And thanks to all of you in our audience who joined us. If you're interested in an encore presentation or you have colleagues that missed the webinar, an audio recording and the slides will be on our website within the next two weeks. Just as a reminder, our website is aia.berkeley.edu. You can also on that website access previous webinars and online tutorials and publications, including a research to practice brief and a tutorial on supporting children of parents with co-occurring mental illness and substance abuse. We greatly appreciate and consider the feedback of everyone participating on the call. The link for the brief online evaluation form will um, has appeared on the screen. Please take a few minutes to complete that form. It'll automatically be sent back to us. I'm sure that Carla would love to receive the feedback. If you have individuals, um, who participated as part of a group, please share that link with each member of your party. Um, also, just to let people know, our center is sponsoring a national symposium in Seattle on July 1st and 2nd. The symposium will focus on supporting children of parents affected by co-occurring disorders. We have some fabulous speakers, um, including Dr. Anda, Linda Scruggs, Nancy Young, um, there are just a few spots left. If you're interested in reading about that, you can also find that on our website, aia.berkeley.edu. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your work with the families and your commitment. All the best. Carla, any, I'll give you the last word. Oh, I just, like, I mean, I think it's what I said, that I, I really appreciate this opportunity and I appreciate the work that everyone is doing. It's clear that we're all passionate about this or we wouldn't be on this call. So I really appreciate that. Wonderful. All right. And I definitely that, would love yes. to get the, the feedback. It's always so valuable, and I, and I just really look at it as your feedback helps me become a better trainer. So I really, really welcome it. Okay, perfect. All right. Good day, all. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.